thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Michael. And I'm here to talk about whale song. So I don't know how many of you have heard these kind of alien sounds of whale songs. I'm just going to play a little bit. They're strange, but I think they're pretty cute. So we didn't have recordings like this until around the 1950s when the American military had a network of underwater microphones that they used to, they were tracking submarines, Russian submarines, and they ended up with a lot of these recordings. They didn't know what this was at first, um, and they held on to them, and it wasn't until the 60s that they turned it over to a couple scientists, this big batch of recordings that I think were made around Bermuda. This is one of them, Roger Payne in the boat. Um, he and Scott McVeigh printed out a lot of these sonograms. You can see that on the left. Uh, the machines to do that back then were not as fast as today. It would take, I think, hours for just a few seconds. And with uh, their, their wives, also brilliant women, they all sat on the floor with these recordings laid out, and they started to transcribe them by hand. You can see that on the right. And they started to notice a pattern. Um, the pattern jumps out pretty quickly that you can see that they're repeating notes, and these notes group together into repeating phrases. And this is how they describe this structure. Um, kind of towards the middle top, you see the word unit. The unit is used to, so the unit is this individual sound you're hearing, each of those individual uh, cries or whoops or little wails or jitters. Um, and the units group together into phrases. And so that's a repeating set of units, the same group of units repeating. Those phrases repeat together in as themes, other groups that these themes then repeat. And so you see this order, these levels of order going up and up towards a song. And then this level of order, it, it continues in both directions. The, a single male whale will, I mean literally single, I think it's, it's a mating call, will uh, repeat the song in what they were describing as a song session. And going back in the other direction towards an individual unit, uh, this can be broken down into subunits that they called, which is just individual pitches that were strung together in what feels like one sound. Um, so fascinating stuff to them that they uh, published this in science in 1971. It made the cover. And um, this was actually pretty influential, uh, these sounds. It definitely helped inspire a lot of people with the whole Save the Whale movement. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of new age baggage around that kind of thing, and think what you want of the sounds, but I think what moved a lot of people was actually this, this structure when you really start to read into it. And this definitely moved me when I first saw this. I was introduced to this by David Rothenberg. He's a fascinating guy. He's a scientist, philosopher, author, teacher, uh, musician, and he's made a lot of these recordings of whale songs himself. He's kind of an expert in uh, this loose topic of like animal art and um, some of this ornamental uh, stuff that you'll find animals doing. So quick rewind about myself and why I was inspired by this. Just as a kid, these are some images that really inspired me. I don't know if you guys can recognize some the squiggly line from Fantasia that made the sound visualizations of the different sections of the orchestra. And there's this kind of like dinosaur civilization book where the dinosaurs are making language with a uh, by stamping their feet. Um, and so growing up, I would make a lot of these little timelines to represent information and encoding um, visual, encoding information as symbols. This is a uh, structure of some Beatles songs categorizing the choruses and the verses together to see how those all look. Here are all their albums together. Um, doing this with sports, it's kind of hard to see, but it's uh, like little spark lines of soccer games to get sort of a bird's eye view. Doing it for baseball to try to create a musical score of a, a baseball game. So when I saw this, um, it just looks ripe for uh, visual interpretation because the whales just laid it out so neatly. So David and I got together and we tried to think what are some ways we could really accent this, this structure and help bring it more to life and just have fun with this. And 
the first step here was some studies, some color studies. So with this example, you can start to see some of the patterns in a, in a different way. You see that the, the groupings, and you can see this is not random. Uh, once you see that, I think there's a bit of an identity it starts to take on. You can, I think this would be pretty trippy if I think of like a dog, if a dog was to make a bunch of arfs in a weird series and just have that repeat over and over again. It takes on a new life. So uh, we took some sonograms of different whale recordings and did a similar thing from before, made color categorizations of these different sound units. And what I don't have slides for right now is part of the process of uh, if you can picture one of these units, say the, the red one, and if we were to take all the red units from a song and kind of sandwich them on top of each other in, in Photoshop, and you, get, you can get a, a, like a visual average, a blob that looks like the general shape of these sounds repeating over and over. So doing that with each of the sound units, this is the nine different units in that song. It was a 1992 recording off of Bermuda also by Paul Knapp Jr. And these are the different nine units. On top is the uh, sonogram output of the unit. And then below is this visual graphic representation. Uh, the goal here was to try to make a little graphic notation system for a song. And so if we look again at the red one on the right, uh, the re you can see that it's a different height than the purple one that corresponds to the sonograms, you know, vertical, the y-axis is the, the frequency, the, the pitch. And that's important here because, I mean, to my surprise, pleasantly found that, I didn't, maybe some of you know this, but just the conventional Western music notation that the staff actually aligns just right there with the, the our conventional Hertz scale. So this is nice because it was a kind of familiar anchor to then just simply overlay what we had already made of these symbols onto the music staff. So it kind of helps familiarize what you're looking at. So here is that song all laid out together. I think actually we can play this. Okay, that's the green, the first green you see, second green. Oh, sorry, purple, red. Green, purple, green, purple, red. So that's a phrase repeating. Purple, red. Now we're going to a new phrase. It's the yellow. I love this one. <laughs> and so I, I mentioned before that a song repeats. So these are this is the same song repeating in one recording. You see the first set up top, that's one song. That same song generally repeats, you know, a little bit of difference. And then a third time. And I think the recording stopped. I think the whale started to move away from the microphone. This is another song here, and um, so you can see that some of these, these symbols are, are different. So this, there's a lot of subjective interpretation happening here, but part of that, I wish there was a way to make a more universal system for the whale songs, that'd be cool. Um, there's a lot of fun facts that I wish I could talk about right now with about whale songs. Uh, you know, these, these are different symbols because the whale song is constantly evolving. I should have specified, these are humpback whales, and um, they have this, I mean, the song travels across hundreds of miles of ocean. Um, and through this, there's this emergent synchronization of the whale songs across the ocean where the whales in a given section of ocean will all actually be singing the same song in a week, in, in that given week. And from week to week, it kind of changes all together in sync. And this is not, when I say a section of ocean, I don't just mean like a bay. I think this is on the order of, there maybe a dozen or so of these um, levels of, of groupings of humpback whales around the world that are all singing one song I mean, in each of these groups. And so this changes from week to week and through the mating season and it'll change the, the following season. So a lot of fun facts about whales that I'd love to talk about, but I, I leave that. I am just a graphic designer, so I can speak more to some of the design decisions that go into this kind of visualization. and. My favorite tension at play with working on this is between that kind of objectively representing the data 
um, versus these artistic interpretations. Because I think, you know, often if you think back at the black and white sonogram, that's certainly a more accurate visual record of the data, of the sound. Um, and so if that's your only goal, is that accurate representation, that, that's great. And often I think it's at odds with other goals, like let's say maximizing the number of people that are seeing this information and really engaging with the ideas beneath it. Um, and so that's when these types of design decisions can help uh, negotiate some of those, those conflicting goals. And this is, I mean, speaking of that balance, this is an old sketch here of, uh, I thought, okay, what if, what if we try getting out of this middle ground of like kind of representing the sonogram, but kind of being graphic? And what if we just have fun little symbols, these glyphs to represent each of the sound types? And I think you know, this swings too far in the other direction, away from uh, the black and white sonogram. And so, yeah, too far, had to swing it back to something like this. Um, but I think the takeaway I want to leave with you guys is to not be afraid to get playful and to try to try to take it too far in the other direction um, with some of your visualizations because uh, you might end up with something that you know, makes someone stop and, and engage with the data and which the information in a new way that you know, might leave an imprint on a kid and go inspire them to do this kind of thing themselves.